This is 10 year old Takata Collins. He's smiling in this photo, but he was anything but happy throughout his whole life. When the paramedics were called to his home in Dayton, Ohio, they were shocked to see the conditions he was raised in. His lifeless body painted the picture of a very dark story. And this was just the beginning of this horrifying case. This is the full story of Takata Collins. Trigger warning, this video contains very graphic descriptions of extreme violence including S.A. against small children. On December 13th, 2019, the emergency services in Dayton, Ohio received a disturbing call. A father found his son unresponsive. Uh, my son is unresponsive right now. Ten-year-old Takata Collins was lying on the floor of his living room with no signs of breathing, and his dad, 30-year-old Al Mutahan McLean, was asking what he should do. But the dispatcher noticed something eerie. McLean didn't seem worried or frantic. Rather, he was complaining to the dispatcher about how disobedient his son was. He, he just hurts himself all the time. He okay. wake up, don't get his way, slam his okay. head, eat his they never end. He would sprinkle the phone conversation with CPR questions and the like. But the main topic was how his son never listened to him. What's more, the dispatcher instructed him to give his son mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. They could hear Al Mutan retching and complaining that Takata's stomach smelled really bad. Minutes later, the paramedics arrived at the address and found Al waiting at the front door. When they came in, they were shocked to their core. Little Takata wasn't just unresponsive. He was purple from head to toe, from bruises and injuries. Why hadn't his father mentioned this? While the paramedics were trying to save Takata's life, a first response police officer spoke to Al Mutan on the front porch. Officer Evans tried to gauge how Takata ended up like that, but Al Mutan said more than he needed to say. Just as he'd done with the dispatcher earlier, he complained for minutes on end about his wild, uncivilized son. The officer was getting a bad feeling about this. The last straw was when the paramedics exited the house to deliver the tragic news. There was nothing they could do to resuscitate Takata. His dad said, All right, I tried to get you guys here as fast as I could. No emotion, nothing. Just covering for himself. You guys, this was just the beginning of the horrific discoveries the police and medics would make in this investigation. Plot twist after plot twist, Takata Collins' case would turn into one of the most horrific child abuse cases in true crime history. Takata Collins was pronounced dead at the scene, and his body was transported to the hospital for further examination. The coroner noted several lacerations, abrasions, and bruises on Takata's head, scalp, face, mouth, and even inside his mouth. Then his chest, neck, abdomen, arms, legs, feet, and private parts. He had older scars on his body too. There was also evidence of previous rib fractures, yet Takata had no medical history. In other words, he received no treatment for the broken ribs. Takata's hands also had signs of pruning, as if he'd been in water for too long. Takata had not died by accident. He died from years of torture. When a doctor examined the insides of his body, they found multiple constitutions to the head, torso, and extremities. He also had severe pulmonary edema, or water in his lungs. Paired with the hand pruning, the coroner's conclusion was that Takata had been forcefully sunk in water repeatedly. And without going into vivid detail, Takata had been treated too. But it was severe bruising around the back of his back that ultimately caused his death. The coroner described this injury as a type of injury specific to catastrophic events, such as serious car accidents. Takata's cause of death was concluded as blunt force trauma combined with compressive asphyxia and water submersion. The manner of death, homicide. While this chilling investigation was taking place, Al Muhatin was still at home with a couple of officers. He told him that he lived alone with his son. It's incredible he thought that this would pass, as just minutes later his girlfriend came back home with her sister and a three-year-old boy. Al Mutan's girlfriend was 30-year-old Amanda Hins, and her sister was Jennifer Ebert, three years younger than her. As soon as they arrived, Al Mutan said, yeah, they actually live with me. And the three-year-old turned out to be Al Mutan's brother, not his other son. A few hours into the home interview, the police retrieved a permit to do a full house search. The ground floor, where they'd stayed so far, was fully furnished and had running water, food in the fridge, 
and photos of pets on the walls. However, there were no pictures of Takata. There were two bedrooms downstairs, one belonging to Al Mouton and his girlfriend, the other to Jennifer. The three-year-old boy also had a room full of toys and clothing, but there was no room in the house for Takata. The police couldn't even find clothes, books, or toys appropriate for a 10-year-old. In the basement, there was a room for dogs, full of crates and waste. Upstairs, though, there was an attic. As soon as the detectives made their way to the attic, an extremely foul smell overtook their senses. It was human waste. There was no light source in the attic either, so the detectives turned on their flashlights. They found no furniture, with the exception of a broken chair. In fact, there was nothing inside the attic but waste and insects. The attic also led to another room secured with a lock. The detectives broke into the room and found a site reminiscent of the worst horror movies. Inside the small room was a bloody tarp in a filthy lawn chair. There was also a camera used to watch Takata when he was inside the room. The camera had recently been disconnected. According to the detectives, this happened as soon as Al Mutan realized his son was dead. And the room with the bloody tarp? Takata didn't always have the luxury of sleeping in it. That was just if he behaved. Normally, he would spend his time in the attic with nothing short of a torture chamber. The three adults living at the residence were immediately arrested and taken in for questioning. So, have you ever been on your rights before? Mm, yeah. You have? Mm -hmm. Okay. When the detective informed Al Mutan that he was being investigated for homicide, he wanted some clarification. Homicide, that's like premeditated. Mm -hmm. Homicide's kind of a catch all for somebody that died more than likely not of natural causes. Make sense? That's the thing. I don't, know, I don't even know why my child is dead. You know, I, I still don't know. If your child's dead? No, they just told me he did, but they didn't tell me what killed him or anything like that, you hear me? Al Mouton was playing innocent, despite all the evidence the police already had against him. So the two detectives in the room reminded him he was the one supposed to tell them why Takata died. That's kind of what this opportunity is for, is for you to yeah, tell us. to discuss it with we you. Weren't there. Right. You were there, we weren't. After reading his Miranda rights, the detectives asked Al Mouton once more what happened today, to which Al Mouton went on about his son's misbehavior. According to him, Takata often harmed himself, played rough, and refused normal food. He even jumped out of windows and ate his own waste. Stating the obvious, but any child who has been through this amount of physical, sexual, and psychological can behave like this. It's scary, I know, but it's real. When Jeannie accidentally stumbled into a welfare office in Los Angeles, 1970, she looked six or seven, weighing just 59 pounds. She held her hands up like a rabbit and stared at the officers like they were from another world. At first, they assumed autism. Then they discovered she could not talk. She was incontinent and salivated and spat. She had nearly two complete sets of teeth. Extra teeth, in such cases, are known as supernamory a rare dental condition. She could barely chew or swallow and could not fully focus her eyes or extend her limbs. It turns out Jeannie was 13 years old. She had been strapped into a handmade straight jacket and tied to a chair in a silent room of a suburban house since she was a toddler. He had forbidden her to cry, speak, or make noise and had and growled at her like a dog. Jeannie made a partial recovery surrounded by doctors, researchers, and psychiatrists, but she was never able to integrate into society or have normal human relationships. So when Al Mutan was telling the detective about his son's feral behavior, it's likely he was telling the truth, except he did not understand that his son was behaving this way because of what he had done to him. Al Mutan seemed to paint the picture that Takata had always behaved in this strange way, so he believed he took his own life. In other words, words, he was trying to shift responsibility onto Takata. The kid keep falling down the stairs, keep knocking his head around. Uh, it looked like something was wrong with his stomach last night that I noticed. And uh, I gave him some water to throw it up. And I know that uh, he used to eat in his own sh So I just wanted to make sure that he was okay. So uh, he drank the water. That was it. And uh, I, I guess he goes back upstairs and acting out some more. It's shocking Al Mutan believes he is now shifting responsibility onto his son. This only painted the true picture of, the very least, his criminal negligence. Since he was two years old, he'd been doing this. 
This only makes it worse. I've been very tired. I ain't slept in three days, so I'm just sitting there. And uh, here he come rolling down the stairs again, ba doom ba doom. A little while later, I go up there, I see a stick in his ass, like a chair leg. So I ask him, what is he doing? And he's just steady, you know what I mean? Just steady doing what he do. Sickening. According to Al Mutan, Takata did this to himself. And when he saw the blood, his dad rushed him into the bathtub to reduce the swelling of the bruises all over his body. By the way, Al Mutan never explained how Takata got those bruises. He just said that he would always play rough and tumble around the house, injuring himself all the time. So, uh, I'm sitting on the couch. He like, Dad, come here. No, he like, Dad, help. So I come up the stairs to help him. And that's when I noticed his body was cold. Almutan said he took his son downstairs and laid him on the floor, hoping he would recover. I mean, uh, I had no clue of knowing that he was sick to that extent. Yeah, you did. Usually, in a homicide interrogation, the detective must work to make the suspect confess how and why they killed their victim. In this case, the detectives had the how. They just had to make Almutan confess to killing his son. However, he still acted like he didn't know how Takata had died and refused to say he ever touched him. First of all, he had marks all over his body. It's every day. Now, sometimes I had to stick his behind just to prevent him from hurting himself. This boy jumped out the window before. Okay, the first admission of touching him. There is no stopping him. I'm afraid. I've been telling people I was afraid, but at the same time, it was nothing I can do. So the detectives went another way. After all, she had pictures of the horrific conditions Takata had lived in at that house. He lived upstairs. At times, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. At times. Well, at first he was living downstairs, but uh, the smell got too strong. Not only that, my little brother, I just got custody of him probably like two years ago, I've been taking care of my little brother. When Almutan got custody of his little brother, he and his girlfriend decided to put him in Takata's room and move Takata into the attic. According to Almutan, Takata didn't behave appropriately for a baby. He would take his clothes off and be aggressive towards his baby nephew. That's why the adults in the house decided he should be kept away from him. Then Almutan started ranting about why Takata didn't have any possessions. Again, he made it sound like this was on Takata, not on himself. I can't get a boy a blanket, because if I give him a blanket, now he has marks all over his body from him and on himself and wrapping around his own blanket. You know what I mean? If he did that continuously, there'd be rashes and, you know, that's unsanitary, flat out. And there, and there ain't no way to keep a child like that. Says the man who kept his child in a room full of feces. Almutan painted the picture that he was overwhelmed by Takata's behavior and was more afraid than anything. When he spoke to social services, apparently, he was told he could put Takata into a specialized facility when he turned 12. That would have been in a year and three days later. He would have turned 11, three days from now. And like I said, ma'am, I am shocked right now at this point that he died. Never seen it coming. Here's a giant hole in the story. On the one hand, he's been blabbering on for 15 minutes about how Takata behaved aggressively and self-destructively. On the other hand, he says he's absolutely shocked that he died and has no idea how that could have happened. Then he added something truly creepy, completely unprompted. But that's, that's the kind of stuff he was into. I ain't never really harassed my child or do nothing like that. That's phobic. And I, I mean, that's and I ain't far from you know what I mean? Wait a minute. One, who asked him if he'd violated Takata? Two, that's the problem with violating your child? That it would be gay? Sheesh. When the detective mentioned the locks on the attic door and the small bedroom inside the attic, Almutan said those were old locks. They used them to separate their pit bulls when they were young and they would fight. But he'd never locked Takata in the attic, he claimed. Then he continued to rant about how dirty Takata was. What am I supposed to do? Call the police and be like, oh, my son is over here eating this shit again today? The detective asked Almutan if he'd ever taken his son to a doctor. He said sure, but not after three years ago when his health insurance expired. Then he said he didn't really need to go to a doctor as he was healthy. Nothing wrong with him. He's eating his own feces. There's something wrong with him. So Almutan went on to say Takata probably had some counseling. I probably uh, had some online counseling services or online counselors talk to him. When I did have counselors speak to him, 
he would play them so slick to the point where it'd be like, you know, he's all good and golden. So his 10-year-old child, who self harmed and then jumped out his own window, would play his counselors slick? He's been homeschooled for the last two years. Who's homeschooling him? Mm, I was. Yep. Why do you have to think about that? I was, my lip hurt. I'm just like, mmm. What's the stuff he's learning about right now? Well, he was learning, but he refused to learn. Every book that I bought him, he on it, he on it, he destroyed it. Pens became a factor of safety and pencils, you know what I mean? And you know what? So you're not homeschooling him. Takata's dad pulled him out of school in third grade. When his son wouldn't learn, he just gave up trying. He never enrolled him back at public school or went through any sort of counseling. It's not like this interrogation could go the right way for Al Mutan. If he tells the truth, the investigators will have a little more information about Takata's death and the precise timeline of events. If he lies, the lies will be used against him in court. There was already sufficient evidence to convict him of murder. By pointing out his conflicting stories and twisted reasoning, the detective is hoping to help Al Mutan give a clear account of what happened on Takata's last day. Uh, 6 a.m. this morning, uh, I look at the camera, I see him plunging on his, uh, his table, I mean his chair. I don't think nothing about it. I'm just like, you know, he's doing his normal weird thing, so sometimes I felt like ignorance was uh, the best answer because he was basically just seeking attention any, at any cost. You know what I mean? Any cost. Yeah, because you kept him locked in a torture room. So I go up there and he's laying on his tarp and uh, he got it in his butt. I'm like, what the hell do you think you're doing? I say, pull it out right now. You know what I mean? Either way. I don't know what you mean because I don't live in your house. If I was the detective sitting in that room with him, I would have lost my cool a long time ago. It's honestly impressive how collected she manages to stay while listening to this sickening story from this sickening man. So, uh, I, I grab it out and it started dripping. So, uh, put him in the shower. I mean, I put him in the bathtub and I try to clean it up and look at it to see if it was, uh, worth me taking them to the ER right away. They are gonna be looking at me like I did this. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's the problem, that you're going to jail. It's chilling how calm and cool Al Mutan speaks about his son's injuries and keeps blaming him for them. Al Mutan was full of lies and kept painting himself as the victim of an uncontrollable son throughout the interrogation. But his two adult roommates would paint a full picture during their interrogations. Before being pulled out of school, Takata went to Horace Mann Elementary School in Dayton. His teachers noticed that he needed some help, but they were unsure what kind of problems he had. He regularly smelled terrible. His haircuts were so bad, he was often getting bullied for it. The school often washed his clothes and gave him fresh ones to wear at school, just so he would be healthier and less prone to bullying. But poor Takata never made any friends at school. He was seen as a weird, dirty outcast. When Al Mutan was notified of these school interventions, he became enraged and threatened the school to stop intervening in his son's personal matters. He actually prohibited the school nurse from ever seeing Takata again. And according to Al Mutan's girlfriend, Amanda, he required daily updates from the teachers. Al Mutan would make him hold loaded book bags in the living room until bedtime. He would also have to stand bent over and cross-legged for hours on end. The school responded by sending CPS several times to their home. But when the CPS agents did arrive, Takata was instructed to stay behind a locked door and not make a sound. So no, it wasn't like how Al Mutan claimed. Takata didn't play counselors or lie to CPS agents. He was scared to death of his evil father. When CPS agents requested to speak to Takata, he was shy, quiet, and gave perfect answers. He had no complaints about his dad or stepmom. But as soon as the agents left, Al Mutan would destroy his son for attracting CPS to the house in the first case. In May 2018, Al Mutan pulled Takata out of school. Now there was no refuge for him. Around this time, Al Mutan and Amanda decided to keep Takata locked in the attic for most of the day. He would only come out to use the bathroom or eat when they allowed him to. All 
All the while, Amanda Hintz presented herself as a mother figure and a homeschooler to Takata wherever she went. In November of that year, Takato jumped from the window of his attic into the backyard. Almutan and Amanda took him to the hospital, and Amanda presented herself as his mom. Takata was treated for his injuries, and the doctors also recommended psychological counseling. What he had done was a big cry for help, but Takata was never taken to psychological counseling. When social workers called them to help set up the appointment, they declined their services. The only thing Almutan did was call the local court and ask about the program they had for delinquent kids. When he learned the program was therapy-based and Takata wouldn't be locked up somewhere, he declined it too. In short, he wanted to get rid of his son. While Almutan and Amanda repaired the attic window, Takata was kept in the basement where the dogs usually stayed. Then he was taken to the refurbished attic. This time he had no light, no furniture, and the door had a heavy lock on it. So no, the lock wasn't for the pit bulls. This was his punishment for trying to escape his house of horrors. Takata was kept in the attic, locked and naked all the time. His clothes had been thrown out. However, if he came downstairs to use the bathroom and he didn't have clothes on, he would be so Takata was only allowed to use the bathroom at night. If he exited the attic during the day, Almutan would accuse him of flashing before his toddler nephew. Almutan also called him girls' names and various unspeakable slurs. Remember the third adult living in the house too? That's right, Jennifer, Amanda's sister. It turns out all three adults partook in the gruesome tour. The three would share the couch and watch Takata on TV through the camera they'd installed in the attic. Takata was instructed to stand in various painful poses for hours on end in his attic alone. If he moved, the two sisters would see this on TV and would instruct Almutan to Heartbreakingly, the police found footage confirming this. And remember how Almutan complained repeatedly during the interrogation that his son ate his own waist? Almutan made him do this. It started out with poor Takata using the attic floor as a toilet when he wasn't allowed to use the actual bathroom. His dad became enraged at this, so he made him eat his own waist as a way of cleaning it. Takata refused over and over again, but Almutan physically forced him to. The abuse got so bad that it was easier for Takata to just do this rather than refuse his dad and await even harsher consequences. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Almutan also had a severe drinking problem. Oftentimes, he would return home wasted and would take out all of his anger on his son. One night, Jennifer heard Takata crying from another room. He said no more, but Jennifer and Amanda testified to Almutan and assaulting his son on a daily basis. On the morning of December 13th, Jennifer called for Takata to come downstairs and use the restroom. He exited the attic, but almost stumbled down the stairs as he had not held on to the walls. He kept falling, standing back up and grabbing walls or the railing. When his dad saw this, he elbowed him in the back. Then he ordered him back upstairs. Once upstairs, Almutan instructed Takata to put away his folding chair and perform his disciplined pose, but Takata did not move fast enough. So his dad pressed him to the ground and him with all his weight. He even reached to the ceiling and pushed down extra hard on his little body. Almutan weighed over 200 pounds. His son's weight was not published, but it was noted that he weighed less than a 10 year old should. Then Almutan came downstairs and casually watched TV with Amanda and Jennifer. However, he kept yelling slurs at his son from time to time. Then he realized he wasn't done. He took a bottle of hot sauce upstairs and pulled it all over Takata's backside and in private areas. According to Jennifer, he'd been doing this to Takata on a daily basis over the last week of his life. He called it parenting. As Takata cried and pled for his dad to stop, Almutan threw him into the walls, grabbed him by the ears, and dragged him down the stairs. Then he took him into the bathroom and ordered him to clean his shorts. Takata just couldn't respond to instructions anymore. He was physically sick and in a state of shock. He was weak from years of prolonged abuse. His dad was responsible for this, but now he was blaming him for being too weak. So he told his son, move faster or you're going to drink. Minutes later, Jennifer heard splashing and Takata grasping for air. Later on, Almutan came out of the bathroom, dragging his son behind him. He took him back into the attic and Jennifer watched what happened next on the TV connected to the camera. It's simply appalling. Takata crawled into the fetal position on the lawn chair and his dad SA'd him with his hand or even the hot sauce. And when he came back downstairs, he tossed a chair leg in the trash can. This was the chair leg he claimed during his interrogation that Takata used on himself. 
off. The coroner concluded the chair leg had indeed damaged Takata's insides, but this was not his own doing. On the afternoon of December 13th, 2019, Takata finally escaped his lifelong nightmare. He would no longer have to endure his father's madness or the other adults' ignorance and complicity. On December 14th, all three adults were arrested and charged with Takata Collins' murder. Inside the police car, Almutan complained about going to prison. He pleaded guilty to kidnapping, and murdering his son. His list of charges is so long, it would probably take five minutes just to read out loud. He was sentenced to 51 years to life in prison and will need to register as a tier three sex offender. Amanda Heinz was sentenced to 22 to 27 years in prison after she pleaded guilty to involuntary and several counts of child endangerment. Jennifer Ebert was also sentenced to eight years in prison for the same charges. She was in the same house as Almutan, yet she never phoned the police or CPS or even tried to stop the Poor Takata never stood a chance from his birth to his untimely death. His mother, Robin Collins, lost custody of him in 2008 after harming him as a baby. When his son was killed, she was out of prison. So the media asked her why she wasn't there for her child, as she knew Almutan was a her answer feels awfully defensive. A person can only call and tell you so much of you not doing anything that they feel like them calling isn't doing anything. If they called 17 times under, not even including the times that I've called, then, and nobody's being done, or maybe they're thinking, oh, maybe they investigated and I don't, and there's nothing going on, or maybe I'm just, you know, d thinking too much of it. Through a series of incoherent sentences, Robin said she thought she was worrying too much. Perhaps Takata was actually fine. By the time Almutan got custody of Takata in 2013, he'd spent his first years with an abusive mother and the next few years in foster care. He already needed all the help he could get. Instead, he ended up with one of the worst monsters I've ever heard of. Remember he'd told the detective he was arrested before? and ch**ed a man years before getting custody of his son. And three days after the custody decision, he beat Amanda with an iron pole. Shockingly, Amanda did not press charges. In fact, she continued to live with Almutan and even participated in Takata. There are few stories as tragic as this. His life turned from worse to worse until he was barely human anymore. No one, absolutely no one, should endure this kind of suffering little Takata did. Prosecutor Linda Dodd said, This was a horrendous case. This child endured years of ongoing, ceaseless, unimaginable for both of these defendants to be headed to prison, that's a significant step. There were a lot of people who loved Takata. Those who dealt with him at schools and those who interacted with him, he was a child who was worthy of love and he didn't find peace in life. We are hopeful that this will bring some peace in his death. Prosecutor Matt Heck pointed out what should happen after a case as horrible as this. I think the time for finger pointing is over with. And I think right now we have to be proactive and be positive and say, what can we do to better the system? So something like this never ever happens again. While it's tragic and it's just unimaginable what this child went through, not just for a short period of time, but for years by these monsters. I think now it's time that children's services, the hospitals, the police, the prosecutors, we all work together, work hand in hand to protect children. Children. Indeed, let us hope that nothing like this ever happens again to another child or any other living being. Hey, thanks for watching. It's hard to even ask you guys to leave a comment. Just write something nice for Takata as we try to remember and honor him today the best we can. Remember to like and subscribe. See you next time.